Well, welcome again, and thank you, Tamara and music team, everyone sharing their gifts and talents this morning so we can have worship. We continue the series on the Beatitudes, and we are in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 16. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then Jesus began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who went before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. And you are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one after lighting a lamp puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to the whole house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. May the Lord bless His word to our hearts and minds this morning. Well, as I said, we continue the series on the Beatitudes. We've been looking at them two at a time, and this is the final week on the Beatitudes as we look at blessed are the peacemakers and blessed are the persecuted. I love the story of this mother who was making pancakes for her two boys one morning, and Kevin was five and Ryan was three, and they began to fight over who would get the first pancake, and the mother saw this as a chance for a little bit of moral instruction, so she looked at the two boys and said, what would Jesus do if he were here? I believe Jesus would say, let my brother have the first pancake. I can wait. Well, without missing a beat, Kevin said to his younger brother, go ahead, Ryan, you be Jesus. (laughs) Well, it reminds me that parents are often peacemakers, and it's not an easy job. And we've been looking at these Beatitudes that are part of the Sermon on the Mount, which Jesus gave on what is now known as the Mount of the Beatitudes. It is a, a beautiful uh, setting where the, the hill slopes down into the Sea of Galilee. There's a level field, and then uh, it slopes back up, and then there's a chapel on the hillside. It has some natural amphitheater effects, so the acoustics are great. But we don't know how many people were there, but we know that thousands have been there before when Pope John Paul was there to celebrate Holy Communion and at other moments. But I think the most important thing is Jesus lifts us up in this moment and sets a hill before us of what it's like to be like Him and live out our life of discipleship. It is a high mount. It is a stretch. But as we think about each of these Beatitudes and we allow God's Holy Spirit to fill our hearts and lives, I believe we can move closer and higher as we strive to live as Christ challenged us to do. And so the first one is, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Peacemaking is so important and never been more important in our world today, and frankly has always been important. When you look at this moment when Jesus talks about being peacemakers, the word peace there is the Greek word irene, which if you know somebody's name, Irene, it means peace or peaceful. But on a deeper level, it comes from the Hebrew word shalom, which you've probably heard before. Now, shalom is still a greeting in the Middle East today. Uh, when people are coming or going, they say shalom. And shalom isn't just peace as the absence of violence. Shalom is very holistic. It includes all of our heart and body. It means to be whole in a healthy way. It means to be emotionally at peace and uh, serene. And it also means uh, a just life. And so it's peace and justice all wrapped into one. And so Jesus talks about being peacemakers where they will be called children of God. Now, peacemaking is, is not easy. And sometimes you see people that almost sort of go to war to bring peace, right? And so that's the last resort. But I think the best way to be peacemakers is what James said 
who's the brother of Jesus, half-brother of Jesus, in James chapter 3, verse 18. And James said this, he said, plant seeds of peace, and you will yield a harvest of goodness and righteousness. And I like that, plant seeds of peace. Now, I know that Gary and some of our farmers are just chafing at the bit to get out there and plow up the field and plant seeds because they love to see it grow. But, you know, when they get out there and plant the field, the next day it's not like there's a harvest. Am I, am I right? So you, you plant the seeds. Some people till it up, and some people just sort of shoot the seeds into the ground, but it still involves tilling afterwards. Uh, it involves fertilizer. It involves the right weather. They're always praying for the right weather, you know, the right amount of rain, lots of sunshine, and it involves time. And someone once said to me, use ideas like seeds, not bullets. And I think that's really true. Now, uh, when you use ideas like bullets, you know, there's all kinds of ricochet fire, and there's lots of lights and cameras in action. Uh, and, and sometimes, I guess, it has a good effect, sometimes not. But when you use ideas like seeds, it takes time, like that corn or bean that's being planted and over time, it yields a harvest. Now, you don't always get credit for what's going on, but good things happen. And I think good things are multiplied. And so, in our own lives, we often have an opportunity to plant seeds of peace. We plant seeds of peace in our, in our kids, in our grandkids, in our neighborhood, in our community, and we have a chance we plant seeds of peace around our world that can make an incredible difference. And it's not easy. There's a story that I love about Heinz. Uh, he was an 11-year-old boy back in 1934, lived in Bavaria, uh, in a German area, and uh, he often witnessed the Hitler youth. Uh, this is sort of the beginning of the rise of Hitler, who would go around and sort of bully uh, kids, later became the uh, browncoats and, you know, the Nazi Gestapo, what have you, but they would bully kids. Uh, Heinz, uh, would stand up for the Jewish kids and for himself. He would get sort of forced into, you know, a conflict many times. Uh, but he learned to stand up for what was right. But then on one particular moment, he began to speak words of peace and compromise and ask questions and bring conversation. And he diffused a fight and kids bullying. He still stood up for what was right, but because he diffused the conversation with some words of peace and understanding, he realized a marked difference in his own life and the whole neighborhood. He began doing that. Well, he was lucky enough. He and his family escaped Bavaria, eventually came to the United States. But that moment always stayed with him about sort of planting words of peace and bringing about peace by bringing about conversation, understanding. And you probably don't know him today by his name, Heinz, but in the 80s and 90s, he became the premier person to work in peace negotiations, and you probably know him as Henry Kissinger. He always remembered bringing peace by planting seeds of understanding. In our own lives, we may not be in that stage, but we can start early, just as he did at 11 years old. When you think about Jesus' life, look at the times that Jesus planted seeds of peace, even in the midst of much conflict. I think of Jesus when he washed the feet of the disciples, and yes, he washed Judas's feet as well. And that's a powerful moment. Yes, he washed Peter's feet, who was about to deny and even betray him in some sense, but find forgiveness later. He planted seeds of faith and peace when he forgave the woman caught in adultery, who became a follower of him. He planted seeds of peace when Matthew was a tax collector, was shunned by everybody, but Jesus went to his house for dinner, and he became a disciple who followed him. What little act today can you do that might plant a seed of peace and understanding? You might not immediately reap the benefits of a harvest, but it might plant and begin to grow and eventually yield a bountiful harvest of good and peace in our world today. You know, it's interesting because Gandhi, who did not call himself a Christian, said that the Sermon on the Mount was the thing that guided his life and his work in peace, and he always followed that. And I think also of Martin Luther King Jr., who stood for justice and worked for justice in peaceful ways, who also followed the Sermon on the Mount. People who strived for a mountain that really was a pretty high goal, who accomplished great things 
but did it by planting seeds of peace, not something that happened overnight. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And then, what is probably the hardest of the Beatitudes, blessed are the persecuted. Oh, we don't want to go there, do we? But let me read what Jesus said. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who went before you. Well, it's a good reminder that, again, blessed isn't just sort of, you know, happy, congratulations, though it can be translated that way, but it's deeper than that. Our life can be blessed even when things are going in a difficult way because God's presence is with us, and I think it's in a special way, and we could be a blessing to others, which is important as well. But when you think about this particular beatitude, blessed are the persecuted, right? I mean, that's a hard one. No one wants to be persecuted, but notice it's for righteousness' sake. In other words, when we stand up for what is right and what is just in the eyes of all eternity, then we may, in fact, face some pushback and even some persecution. And I think in this moment, it's also important that many times people who work for peace and justice, who are peacemakers, become persecuted, right? We don't do it to become persecuted, but sometimes when we stand up for what is right. Jesus puts this in the sort of the broad sweep of all the prophets of the Old Testament. And uh, one of the litmus tests of the prophet in the Old Testament, remember what that was? is that people are not happy about what you're saying, okay? So if you stand up for what is right, you're going to be persecuted, right? So that was a litmus test of what it was like to be a true prophet. So Sunday mornings, if everything doesn't go your way, know that maybe things are are being said that's right. The important thing is, are we following God's will and God's way? And are we standing up for what's right, even if we're going against the grain of society? And it's not an easy thing to do because, honestly, our culture is not moving in that direction. But Jesus never moved in the direction of culture. Jesus challenged us to climb the mount of the Beatitudes, climb the mountain of God, and to stand up for what is right. You know, there's an interesting moment in the book of Job. Job is like one of the longest books in the Bible. It's 42 chapters. And you know the story of Job is uh, sort of this big stage of of all the world, and uh, the tempter goes before God Almighty and uh, God says, look at my servant Job. He's just an amazing guy. And you know, the tempter says, well, of course, you know, you make everything easy for Job. He's got cattle, and he's got crops, and he's got prosperity and kids and all this. And the tempter says, you, you just let me touch his family and see if he doesn't curse you and ask to be killed. And God says, go ahead. And so he has all this. He has children who children who perish, and he has crops that fail and cattle that die, and and then uh, he doesn't curse God. And then more things happen, and uh, his friends come and say, what are you doing that's wrong? You must must repent, and uh, and then when you get right with God, things are going to go right. And so Job goes into prayer, and he says, God, what have I done that's wrong? And he couldn't think of anything. He went through all these things, and it says Job was an upright person. But he continued to follow God. And even his wife told him to curse God and die. And finally, at the end, sort of shorten all of this, Job goes before the Lord, and he just is asking question after question after question to God. You know, why is this happening? And then he finally hears from God. And God sort of echoes through eternity to Job and says, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the world? Where were you when I put the stars in place? Where were you when I created the birds of the air and the cattle of the field and the creatures of the deep? Where were you? And it goes on for a while. And it's interesting because God never answers Job's question. Job never gets the answer that he wants, right? Why do bad things happen to good people? Don't we all want to know that? Why do bad things happen to good people? There's lots of possible answers, but Job never gets the ultimate answer. And in the end, Job comes to this point in Job 42, the last chapter. He has this moment of reckoning where he says about the Lord, before this, I heard about you with my ears, but now 
I have seen you, and I know you in my heart. Before I heard about you, but now I know you. I've experienced you deeply. And maybe that's the answer, that it isn't the answer for our head. It's the answer for God's presence amidst the difficulties of life. Because it's a lot easier to talk about carrying the cross than to carry the cross. And it's a lot easier to talk about being persecuted than it is to go through persecution or to go through sickness and suffering and all the things that we go through in this life. But what God promises is not an answer on this side of eternity about how everything is laid out in the universe, but on the other side of eternity we will know. But God promises His presence. And Jesus said in John 16, He said, In this world you will have troubled, but I have overcome the world. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. John 16, 33. Our peace starts with peace with Christ, and we plant seeds of peace around us. Sometimes it ends up with us being persecuted. Sometimes people say false things about us. Sometimes people wish ill or devise evil schemes against us. But if we stand for what is right and just and true, then from the perspective of eternity, we are blessed, and we are doing what God wants us to do. These Beatitudes are really, really, really hard. Now, thankfully, we don't have to measure up in order for God to love us. God loves us and lifts us up. But God does strive for us once we've experienced Christ, His love, His forgiveness, and grace with a change of heart to try to strive to live for a higher goal on this mountaintop. Now, I want you to notice that there's a bit of a progression that goes through these Beatitudes as we sort of wrap this section up in the Sermon on the Mount. Because it starts with, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for this is the kingdom of heaven. So, to be poor in spirit is to recognize that we are all in need. And then, when we do that, we are mourning, but we find comfort. Now, sometimes we mourn because we've lost some, but we also mourn because we realize that we are in need. But then we discover that in meekness is gentle strength as we follow God as Christ did. And then we hunger and thirst for righteousness. And all these are sort of us changing from within as we follow Christ. And then we move towards more outflowing beatitudes. Blessed are the merciful as we show mercy to others. You can't do that without living out your life. Blessed are the pure in heart, which is a singleness of following God. And then blessed are the peacemakers. You really can't do that without living in relationships around us. And finally, blessed are the persecutors, because if you do all that, there's a good chance you stand up for peace and justice and live the way that God wants you, that you're going to face some pushback and definitely some resistance from our culture around us. But Jesus said that He would be with us through all this, that His peace and presence and power would be with us. I want to close with a couple of thoughts. And the first is this, that true story. I don't know if you've ever read In His Steps by Charles M. Sheldon, who's a pastor, but it's a true story. And the story came about by this man interrupting this church service, and he was very shabbily dressed. And he had just lost his wife the week before because he was poor and she couldn't afford medical attention. And so he walked in the middle of this church and he interrupted and he said, it seems to me that a lot of less bad things would happen in the world if people like you would just do what you sing. Because I was sitting on the steps the other night and I heard you singing all to Jesus, all to Jesus, all my thoughts and will and desires. But it just seems to me that if you just lived out what you sang, it'd be a different world. And so the pastor began to explore in a series of messages, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do if he was a banker? What would Jesus do if he was a lawyer? What would Jesus do in day-to-day -day life, everyday situations? And what he discovered is if you probably acted like Jesus, you'd turn the world upside down, and you'd create a lot of havoc, and you'd probably meet a lot of resistance. But you would make a difference. And so sometimes we have those bands, what would Jesus do? 
but it's so much easier to wear a band and to talk about it than to actually live it out. And so Jesus challenges us to live it out. And so, just like Ryan and Kevin, it's easy to say, you be Jesus, I'll take the first pancake, but you and I can follow Christ. What would Jesus do? Jesus has told us what we could do, follow the Beatitudes. I want to close with Jesus' words, which are so profound and poetic, but also challenging and practical. Jesus said this, you are the salt of the earth, but the salt has lost its taste. How can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one after lighting a lamp puts it under a bushel basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Amen.